Hey guys, this is Eden, and we are back for part four of this series. So, in with this tutorial, we will actually go through back propagation, and finally finish our first neural network from scratch. So, what is back propagation, and why do we need it? So, back propagation. If you remember where we left off last time, well, we have the issue of when we're building a neural network. We don't know if we're in our hidden layer. We have nothing to compare our hidden layer to. We don't know what it's supposed to be. Whereas with our output layer, we have a label for that output. So if we're testing what type of flower we should get, at we know if it should be maybe a type one, type two, or type zero. But at our hidden layer, we have no way, that data isn't relevant. So what we need to do is once we calculate the actual loss or the error at our output layer, we need to back propagate it or multiply it backwards so that we have that reference in our hidden layers and bef anything before the output layer. So let's get to that. So just looking here, uh, I ha we have delta loss, right? And we want to multiply that by each of the weights on the synapses going backwards. That way, if the synapse has a high weight, we know that that node contributed a lot to our overall loss. So we want that node to take more of the blame. So we multiply it backwards all the way through, our, through all of our layers. Here we don't have too many layers, so it's not that bad. But that will give us a measure of how much error each node contributed. So now we'll go over that in the actual math. It might look complicated, but just remember what I just said, because that's all there is to it. So I, sorry, I didn't get the recording for this part. But we have y, and this is just the equation we saw in the last episode, y minus y hat, the error in our prediction, times the rest of that is gives us the derivative of our loss. The only thing that I kind of need to change here is where we, have w, where we had w2 before, we now want that to be w1 because we're now finding the derivative with respect to the first set of weights instead of the, sec, instead of the second set. We already found how we need to change the second set, so now we just need to find how we need to change the first set of weights. So now, because we're doing that, we can actually expand the hidden layer on the right there, and we can expand it into the sigmoid of input of the input layer times the first set of weights, because that's what gets us our hidden layer, right? So if we expand that and we take the partial derivative, what we'll see is that we can actually move the W2 up front above that because it's just a constant now because we're taking the partial derivative in respect to the first set of weights, not the second. So we move that in front and then we take the derivative of that last part right there, the sigmoid n times w1, and we get sigmoid prime of the same thing. And then we use the chain rule to take the derivative of the what's inside the sigmoid prime, which gives us just the n or the input layer. So here we actually, it's, this is all there is to it. This is our final equation. And you might notice I'm writing delta L1 here. And delta L1 is just equal to everything uh, up that, and that's in that little box. I just don't want to write the whole thing out again. Um, so that's actually the entire equation for updating our second weights. So if you actually look at it in comparison to the equation above that, you'll notice that it's really, really similar to what we derived in the last episode to update the second pair of weights. There's only one small kind of difference actually. So you'll see that y minus y hat is basically equivalent to the delta L1 times the second set of weights. Then we have another sigmoid prime that matches up just perfectly. And then the n is replaced, the h is replaced with an n uh, wherever you see it. So what's actually happening here is the reason it's so similar is because we're doing the same thing. The only difference is that our error is being back propagated so that y minus y hat is no longer our error. Our error is our delta error from our output layer multiplied backwards. That's really the only difference. And then we replace our hidden layer with our input layer because we are now calculating the first set of weights and not the second set of weights. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's actually get back to the code and code this up. Cool, so back here, what we want to do first is we want to back propagate our error like we just did, except for now in code. So we'll recalculate the delta loss for this layer. 
and the delta loss now will just be the old delta loss multiplied back through the transposition of our weights. And by transposition, I just mean we're doing that horizontal line, not horizontal, we're just doing, putting that diagonal line from the top left corner to the bottom right corner of our weights, flipping them over, and essentially that gives us the effect of multiplying it backwards through the weights. And again, pay attention to the order of your multiplication because it does matter. And then we're multiplying it by that sigmoid prime that we had a second ago when we were writing it out. So now that we've back propagated that error and we multiplied it by sigmoid prime, the only thing we have left to do is multiply it by the input layer. And again, we transpose the input layer because we're going backwards. Don't worry too much about that. And don't worry about the reshape. The reshape, I think when I did this before, for some reason, it was just in the wrong shape. We're just turning a column into a row or a row into a column. It's not very important for the actual understanding. Cool. We multiply that by our delta loss, and now we know how much to actually update our weights by. And finally, the moment we've spent like two videos for, we can actually update our weights properly. So the second weight, because we subtract alpha times our delta w2, and we do the same thing for w1, our first set of weights. And what alpha is, is it's a parameter we made earlier. It's set to 0 0.1 is what we made it. And it's how much we want to change the weights by. It's a factor. So if we don't, we usually don't want to change the weights by exactly delta w2 and delta w1. That's a little bit too much. Oftentimes we'll overshoot that low point and we'll go to the other side of the curve, which is no good. So we want to go a little bit at a time, ease our way there. So the next thing we'll do is we'll create a list of losses. And when we plot our actual loss, so we can see how our network is doing, this will just keep those losses that we're going to plot. And now we'll initialize our actual weights, w1 and w2, to random numbers in between negative 0.5 and 0.5. So the actual dimensions of these, as we went over in the forward propagation tutorial, are the amount of rows is the same amount as the input coming into this weight layer, and the number of columns is the output, how many you're outputting. So now we actually start with our epics. So remember one epic is one set of training over all the data. And after our epics, we are going to loop through every set in our training data. So I'm putting the minus 15 right here. So when we're looping through our data, what we want to do is we actually want to reserve a portion of it for testing and a portion of it for training. So I was thinking about 15. So we can reserve about 15 for testing and use the rest for training. So let's actually go back and create just another little block right here. And we can actually separate our data into two different variables train x and test x, and then train y and test y, and this will probably work a little bit better to keep track of it all. So now if we come back right here, we can replace this with our train x instead of our iris x. Now we don't have to worry about that minus 15 from earlier, which was just a little extra. So now we can actually go ahead and use our train function. And I forgot to make sure that it actually returns our updated weights and our loss because we need to actually update our weights. So we need to return them and we want to return our loss so we can print that out and graph it to kind of see how our model is doing. The loss is kind of, a, we can look at it as a measurement of how well our model is performing. So now we can actually use our train function and get those back from it. So we'll just pass in on this loop our one set of attributes and our one label, and then our two sets of weights. Also, every 50 iterations, we're going to want to print out the number of the epic and what our loss is at that epic. That way we can keep track of our loss throughout the training process because the training process is not instant, it actually takes time and we want to see how it's doing throughout. That way we can also kind of see when it's reached its kind of limit. Every five iterations, we are going to append our loss to our losses list, and that way we can plot it at the end and get a nice graph to see how we did overall. So now we can actually plot the loss right here, and I make a little mistake, so at least it's working, but not really because we can see that the loss is not going down, which is very bad. That means we're not improving. So clearly something's wrong, and I just indented this wrong. So if we move that back out, we should be all good. And now if we run this, we can see that it's actually going down. So that's good. It looks like it's doing better. Honestly, it drops so fast that 500 epics is probably 
way too much, but whatever, it works for us, and it doesn't take that long, so we can keep it there. So next, we're going to go ahead and make this accuracy function, and the accuracy will do a very simple accuracy test. There's a few different ways you can test accuracy, but we're just going to take the R prediction and check if it's actually right on these 15 samples that we saved for testing, and just kind of a number for you guys. Most people usually save about 15 to 20 percent of their data for testing. The actual number is up to you, but that range is pretty common and it works pretty well. So the argmax function right here just gets the index of the highest number in this array. So if we do an in in forward and actually forward propagate our test data, we should get a prediction of what this type of flower this is. And then we add one just because if it's type zero, really that's a type one flower. Index one is a type two flower. Index two is a type three flower. So then we can take the actual data and we'll do the th same thing with the argmax and adding one. And now all we have to do is compare them. And if they're correct, we increment correct by one. And then at the end, we just print out how many are correct out of the total amount and multiply that by 100 for our accuracy. So now actually just looking at this accuracy, 70% is awful. There was a mistake. So the first mistake is that this iris y should be train y, right? Now, if we go through this again, we can see that this still looks good, but now we're getting even worse accuracy because we made one more issue. And that is right here, instead of layer two, this should be a underscore layer two for our activation layer two. Just a little mistake there because our output layer, we get that by multiplying our activation layer two buyer weights. And now we can see I added a little bit to actually see what our predictions are. We get 93% accuracy, pretty good, not too bad for our first go. And we can see, we can actually see that what our prediction is and what our actual value is. So let's multiply this for 100 to get the actual, at the actual percentage. And now that kind of wraps up making our first neural network. We can see our only error right here. We only made one issue. Where's the culprit? Where's the culprit? It is right here. We predicted a three, but it was actually a two. What a shame, just one off. But that wraps it up. Thank you for joining me in creating our first neural network completely from scratch. Pretty amazing. Just in over the course of less than an hour, being able to create something so complex from scratch. So where I'm planning on going after this is actually creating a lot more of these types of videos introducing neural networks and stuff like that. The actual next couple videos I plan to do is using our own data set and formatting it by ourselves because that's what you'll be working with most of the time. And then from there, introducing you guys to TensorFlow so that we can speed this process up and make some more awesome projects from there. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you guys tune in for the next video on neural networks. See you guys later.